So, uh, Ipe and team and Yoko, thank you very much for having me. I want to contribute with a talk on uh, more intraaxial disease now because we've heard a lot about CP angle and extraaxial disease. And I want to talk about nuances of uh, the Tilovila approach for intraventricular lesions reaching the CP angle. Um, so, first of all, are these intraventricular tumors a real challenge? And I think the answer is yes, because they're usually rare. They're surrounded by high real estate, and uh, especially in younger staff, experience is lacking. But don't be intimidated. If you follow some principles, it really works. And there are many options out there for you to join. So what we want to look at is left side tumors uh, that are located in the foramen lushke and uh, tumors that are located in the ventricle proper. Um, they're all pathologies that can be found in this arena. So for today, we just want to look at ependymomas, meningiomas, and maybe at the end, the neuroepithelial cyst as an example of how to tackle this problem best. These patients often uh, present with vague symptoms. Um, they are not tumor specific, but location specific. And in the PFOS, you know, most patients present with a mixture of nausea, vomiting, dizziness, men mental status change, maybe from hydrocephalus, occasionally combined with visual compromise, tinnitus and apraxia. But um, often patients come with rather little symptoms and rather large tumors. Um, symptoms are nonspecific, which makes these tumors often a late diagnosis, especially during COVID. We have noticed that patients often show up months later than expected, and you often find syndrome of the fourth ventricle, which are uh, symptoms of the cerebellum in combination with obstructive hydrocephalus. So for your infrontatorial access, there's several routes to get in, and it all started with Dandy, as you know. There are two classic approaches. One would be the transvermium approach coming from medial to lateral, splitting basically the inferior half of the vermis to gain access to the ventricle on top. Or you come in from far lateral transcondylar. I think uh, this works lateral to medially well for located uh, lesions in the CP angle or extra axial disease, such as uh, aneurysms and sometimes meningiomas. For interventricular lesions, I've largely abandoned this. I think the far lateral approach has a very small field of view and also significant postoperative morbidity because you really peel down the muscles along the side of the neck and the patient is in significantly more pain and contraction than with midline approaches. The midline transvermian approach are also not so hot because a lot of patients ended up with uh, speech trouble, aphonia, dysarthria, ataxia some uh, truncal hypotonia, and even memory and cognition problem from a violation of the fiber tracts to the dentate. So don't go just through the midline, really think about how you can do this best. The last time I used the transvermium approach was this case. This was a 14 year old boy that collapsed in the soccer field, came in with a GCS of three and pupils small, three millimeter, but essentially fixed in mid position no signs of external trauma. So when we got the scan, we got a CTA right away and you see a large intraaxial hematoma fed by an AVM below. So this is the last time I did a midline hemicraniectomy bilateral, oh, I said posterior craniectomy. And we just made a mini tunnel approach to basically suck out the clots, leave a small portion on the AVM to stop it from rebleeding, but decompress the P fossa. But this is really the only emergent access where I think transvermian approach is still suitable. The real answer for the problems in this locale are the cerebellomedullary fissure approach as championed by Roton's group and especially Matsushima. This is a beautiful approach that avoids splitting of the vermis and allows best access to the fourth ventricle and the lateral recess versus natural planes. This is the original publication what you want to uh, achieve is basically access to the mid portion of the ventricle up to the aqueduct. You can go laterally into the lateral recess and you can attack tumors of the lateral wall and you can go as low as the foramen lushke. 
in a cadaveric overview. This looks a bit overwhelming. Initially, it looks complicated, but honestly, it is not. If you first follow a simple scheme, you identify your cerebellum medullary fissure as the space between the uvula and the tonsil. And as you follow that space lower down laterally, it's the space between the medulla and the tonsil. So it's not very different from looking at a Chiari approach. On the board, they sometimes ask you about the boundaries of the cerebellum medullary fissure. Think about it in simple terms. The roof is formed by the inferior vellum of the fourth ventricle. Laterally, from the foramen margin D, laterally, you have the tela choroidea curving over the limbus down to the lateral recess of the foramen lushke. What do you find in it? The pica branches and branches in the veins of the cerebellum medullary fissure. For surgery, positioning is key. I think uh, prone position is best. I don't do this sitting. Flexion in the atlanto-occipital joint and flexion in the cervical spine will help you a ton, which means the chin should be really tucked in with only a finger breath below. So military position. I always use intraoperative monitoring to avoid stretch <clears throat> and not uh, um, compromise the flow of the fourth ventricle. And I also use monitor uh, evoked potentials. <clears throat> Positioning uh, allows you to decide between a unilateral approach, which can be done in Fukushima's three-quarter prone position, can also be done concord, head down first, and you operate upside down, or I operate mostly in a position where the patient is prone with the head up, just like a carry. And this is what you would see, rather similar to a carry in this case, you want to start with a panoramic overview. So let's break this down into step by step. There are four surgical steps. First one is identify your fissure. Just like in Chiari, you want to see the tonsils peel off the arachnoid here, and then insert a little spatula and lift up the tonsil 45 degrees laterally. I use a Greenberg retractor with a Ruggles blade or Fukushima blade. You can use whatever you like. In the end, what you want to do is you want to identify the obex and the overlying tailor. And by identifying the tailor, you cut 45 degrees lateral and out after coagulating the little vessels in the uh, cerebellum medullary fissure. And then you expose your core plexus and you just follow the path until you turn over the limbus and can go to the Framandushke. This is how it looks without vessels in a cadaveric special. First, find your obex and the foramen, identify the tela. So find the tela and identify how do we go towards the uvula laterally and the telovelar junction. Then you cut the tela after coagulating this at 45 degrees. And you can basically look into the lateral recess and then you turn a corner and go down to the foramen dushke. Same steps with the vessels in. Again, find the obex, which is sometimes compressed by the tonsils. Second step, put in your retractors and elevate the tonsils. Now identify the tela choroidea, coagulate these vessels carefully. This is with the zoom magnification. You see how beautifully these little vessels play out. Bipolar this carefully, go at 45 degrees until you hit the lateral recess and orient yourself. Whenever you have a problem, just take a step back and think, you know, what are my overall contributors to this locale, and you will definitely stay safe. Now you have to make a decision of the extent of your opening. If you have a large tumor, you can do bilateral openings of the two components of the cerebellar medullary fissure. But if you have a unilateral tumor just going into the lateral recess, you can as well do just unilateral exposures. And if you truly have a tumor only sitting into the foramen lushke, there's no need to open the upper portion, which keeps you safe. There's a beautiful paper um, by Tomasello in World Neurosurgery in 2015 that I really recommend to all learners. It comes not only with a beautiful diagram, how to do it, it comes with a small video clip that takes you through the case. This is how it looks in his exposure. You identify the obex, you see the flow of the fourth ventricle with the stria medullaris. You see the tumor hanging down, identify the tailor laterally, cut it 45 degrees, and he shows you how to suck out this tumor. Now, a few examples. This was a meningioma WHO grade two. 
you can see that the tumor was relatively high riding in the fourth ventricle. So we had to pick a very steep angle. But if you flex the head substantially and you do a bilateral wide approach, you can elevate the cerebellum very nicely and go through a natural cleft without sacrificing any of the vessels and the patient had a perfect outcome. This is a young child with a larger tumor, solitary fibrous tumor, again reaching almost the aqueduct, approached through the same way, um, easily accessible. This was an ependymoma unilaterally more on the right than the left and see how intimately the pica is involved in this case. The telovela approach really allows you to follow your vessels and we were able to chisel out the entire tumor and you see the pica still hanging in the breeze. We didn't lose a single branch. There was no post-operative stroke. The patient could be discharged two days after surgery. Now, if you do unilateral exposure, there's a beautiful paper by Jean and co colleagues in neurosurgery. It's the same idea from midline to lateral by just elevating one tonsil. So as you identify your obex, the telochoroidea, you may have to mobilize the pica to make that 45 degree cut. But if you do, you see the choroid plexus and the rhomboid lip, and you can really gain access right to the foramen lushke. These are lesions that you can take out, either small ependymomas, meningiomas, or lesions in the fourth ventricle, um, quite successful. This is a cavernoma on the opposite side, equally accessible and uh, intraaxial disease, but was uh, nicely accessible through this approach. Now I wanna show you two pearls. This was a case that came to me, which I really didn't know what this could be, ring enhancing lesion in the fourth ventricle in a patient who just had nausea and swallowing difficulties. On the T2 images you see, it is intraaxial dinging into the floor of the fourth ventricle, so his nausea was well explained. There was a nerve emanating on the T2 images just lateral to the lesion from the brainstem. We got CTAs showing low vascularity of the lesion, so I felt the risk was not too high to go after this. Um, I got DTIs showing beautifully displaced motor tracts, which you can see here in blue, running deep to the lesion and then displaced to the contralateral side. So there's a good access corridor on the ipsilateral side. And again, we wanted to pay attention to the nerves, so we monitored this case. As we came in from inferiorly telovela approach, we're able to chisel out 90% of the tumor except the lateral wall of this tumor that turned out to be a ganglioglioma WHO grade one. Each time we try to peel off the last part of this tumor, his 10th nerve was activated on interoperative monitoring. With benign disease, I really didn't want to give the guy a deficit, so I stopped at this point. And I'm observing him since. If the tumor ever progresses, I may give him radio surgery to this location. Last case is this telovela approach for a unilateral biaxial disease. So this is, a, as you can see, a hypo-intense tumor occupying the fourth ventricle, but also splaying the foramen lushke and wrapping around the brainstem. On DWI, you can see this is an epidermoid that sort of has a star-shaped configuration and distorts the tissue quite a bit. Here again, we were able to just use a standard approach and follow each of the crevices around the brainstem. DWI post-op shows complete resection and no stroke. So very suitable for this type of disease if you get the viewing angles right. So my summary is um, intraventricular surgery is fun. Think inside the box and know your anatomy really well. Be safe and sometimes zoom in, zoom out to reorient yourself. Uh, it sounds complicated, but it's actually quite doable. Think outside the box and be versatile with your approaches. Sometimes just do a unilateral approach and use your common sense with uh, your strategies. You will see it's rewarding. Thank you very much.